This is Michael Popak, and it's after dark. Do you know where your legal AF is? Mark Meadows, remember him? Chief of staff for Donald Trump before he decided to become an insurrectionist. Got indicted in Georgia. Almost got indicted in D.C. and definitely got indicted in Arizona. He's decided one more time to try to take his state prosecution over to federal court. What fundamental legal principles does Mark Meadows and his lawyers not understand as Donald Trump, in addition to all of that, decides that he just can't find the time to file a brief with the 11th Circuit to talk about his win. The guy wins a case and he can't figure out how to file a brief on time in the 11th Circuit. And that has a cascading impact on all the other criminal trial dockets leading into the November election. We break it all down. We connect the dots on the midweek edition of Legal AF. Take a listen. Let's kick it off with um, Mark Meadows, uh, the Arizona case, what that's all about and what just happened to him in the uh, in the federal court with a federal judge there as he tried the exact same argument that he tried and failed with in Georgia. Why don't you take it, Karen? Yeah, so Mark Meadows, if you remember, is the former White House chief of staff under Donald Trump. And when he was indicted in Georgia with uh, in front by Fonnie Willis, he was one of the defendants who tried to have the case removed to federal court and saying, essentially, you can't prosecute me in state court. You have to prosecute me in federal court. And the reason he and others want to do that is because if they can make a showing that they were acting on officially, essentially, and within their job description, they would then ask to apply the immunity, the presidential immunity uh, by extension doctrine that the Supreme Court has created, this new law. So that's why they are so desperate to get to uh, federal court so that the supremacy clause would apply and uh, essentially dismiss the Georgia case against them. And he, that failed in Georgia, but he's trying the same thing in Arizona now based on this new decision, right, that came out in July. He did this before in Georgia before, and now he's one of, uh, I think, 18 defendants who is charged in Arizona. Very similar in the sense that it's uh, the fake elector conspiracy is charged with conspiracy, fraud, forgery, that sort of thing about the um attempt to deliver all the fake electors. And the judge in Arizona, this is a federal district judge, found that Mark Meadows failed to demonstrate that the conduct charged in the state prosecution related to his, the color of his office when he was chief of staff to the president. So the court essentially um, credited uh, the court said that they credited Mr. Meadows' theory that the chief of staff is responsible for acting as the president's gatekeeper. However, that conclusion doesn't create a causal nexus between Mr. Meadows' official authority and the charged conduct. That's a quote from the decision and a conclusion by the judge. The judge's name was Tucci, I believe. And, um, you know, look, it was a, it was a, uh, an attempt to once again be immune from this behavior and the federal district court basically said not so fast you know we're not removing this case so this is the way the state's indictment is written you're guilty right you're not, and and he was basically trying to reframe the indictment of just merely facilitating communication and staying abreast of the campaign goings on and the judge said that's that's not what the allegations are the allegations are that you had a much more active role in this so um you know he he basically called him out and said look you know the Few, if any, of the state's factual allegations even resemble the, the secretarial duties that Mr. Meadows maintains are the subject of the indictment. I love the way federal judges write. So, you know, he's just basically said, essentially, he orchestrated and participated in this illegal electioneering scheme. That's how the indictment's written, and that belongs in state court. So it was sent back down to state court. I thought that was a pretty powerful, uh, pretty powerful smackdown. Yeah. And if he doesn't like it and Mark Meadows won't and his lawyers there won't, they'll do what they tried to do when they didn't like the ruling by Judge Jones in Georgia, in which he found the exact same thing after an evidentiary hearing. One of my favorite comments from the Arizona judge was a version of, 
you don't want to remove the indictment. You want to rewrite the indictment. <laughs> Love that because that's that's what he learned that from Donald Trump, the lawyers uh, for for Mark Meadows. Um, they just totally create a straw man and completely rewrite the indictment and then try to argue. It's just it's just what chiefs of staff do. We just schedule and order lunch and make sure that the president is connected with constituencies and other on, in the halls of power. Like, what are you talking about? That has nothing to do with the what the indictment indictment charges you with. Um, and so, no, you're, you're, you, I'll take it at face value, the judge said, that you're a federal officer, but you're not within the federal color of law. And more importantly, you missed your deadline. The judge also said you're 18 days late in filing your notice of removal. You had 30 days. You filed it 48 days after your arraignment. And all of your excuses that, well, we were in negotiations with the prosecutor. So what? You got to do that on a parallel track. That doesn't allow you. And I can't, you know, removal is strange. It's one of those, there's a few of them in the law where the judge can't give an extension of time. You have to file it within your 30 days. And if you miss it, you got to hope to God you got good faith, a good faith cause reason, just cause why you missed it. Just as you don't have just cause, you were talking to the prosecutors, the Arizona attorney general, good for you. What else you got? And he said, oh, well, uh, we we're waiting on the immunity decision from the uh, the court. He goes, well, that may have been helpful to Donald Trump, but that doesn't mean you don't, you know, for, for those out there that come to our show for some legal knowledge as well, a notice of removal is a one page, one paragraph document that takes you all of, I don't know, 15 minutes to prepare and file. So that's why the judge was like, I don't know what you're talking about. You file it and then you watch for the immunity decision. And if you don't like the results of it, you can always expand the grounds for your, your appeal. You know, no. So no, you're late. And even if you weren't late though, I'm going to kill your case because it's not within the color of your office. It's not within your scope of duties or your job description as chief of staff to try to overthrow democracy. So let's switch gears, Karen, over to the 11th Circuit. Um, Donald Trump won that one, and yet he's still with his lawyers, Emil Bove and Todd Blanche. Can't, they're just stretched so thin. Um, and I want to talk about the timing of what they're arguing, because they got a, and they mentioned a number of it in their motion for more time. They needed 30 days. They asked for an additional 30 days because their brief would have been due in about a week, about 10 days. This is this is the issue, uh, just to remind people. Mar-a-Lago, they got Aileen Cannon, for some the reasons that will remain nameless right now on this particular analysis. They got Aileen Cannon, whose patron is Donald Trump, who put her on the bench, to make a decision for the first time in the entirety of our federal judiciary, the entirety of our federal jurisprudence, that the special counsel, independent counsel, special prosecutor, whatever you want to call that position, is illegitimate and illegitimately appointed and not an appropriate inferior officer under the Constitution as appointed by the head of the department, which is Merrick Garland, the head of the Department of Justice as attorney general. First judge to ever rule that way. More importantly, dozens of judges have said the exact opposite. And even more importantly, according to the special prosecutor, she violated the cardinal sin of being a sitting district court judge. She did not respect the rulings of her bosses above her. That's called she violated hierarchical stare decisis because that's a highfalutin way of saying the Supreme Court in the Nixon case already told you how to make this decision. That's your binding precedent you need to file. Plus, there was some other precedent in the 11th Circuit as well that she completely ignored. You can't do that. You can't just make up new law out of whole cloth unless that area has never been addressed before. So that's a big problem for her. So Trump wrote a motion asking time, it sounds like the Florida lawman beep, asking, asking for time to file his brief because he's got problems in Manhattan in the criminal case that came out of your old office, and he's got problems in the District of Columbia. Why don't you walk the audience through all of these problems? Yeah, he he essentially is he wanted more time because he's like, I'm busy. I have to spend time in a skiff, you know, this sensitive compartmented. Um, I always forget what it's called, the classified information facility. And it's where it's the skiff is the place where when you have classified classified documents or, or evidence and you want to show it to a defense attorney or even if prosecutors want to look at it or go over it with witnesses, you have to go into what's called a skiff and you have to leave your devices outside. And it's, you know, it's just it's a very 
it's a place that has you can't penetrate it with electronics and it's it's how you have to uh, look at really sensitive and classified information and so what they basically said was look we need more time we spend too much time in a skiff in the washington dc case we can't possibly get to this so he asked for more time and you know look the 11th circuit has one of this you always get one adjournment you always get if you ask for 30 days you always get it and i think the prosecutor i think jack smith even agreed to it here so it was clear they were going to do it right but the problem is by doing that this pushes us way out after inauguration i mean oral arguments aren't going to happen anytime soon and appeals take a long time and so they're not even going to schedule oral, oral arguments until after the inauguration. We know what that means, right? We know that that means that if Donald Trump wins the election, say goodbye to all these cases that are federal. He's going to uh, pardon himself and dismiss the cases, right? Which is one of the reasons why these state cases are so important. The New York case, the Georgia case, and, you know, it's, it's the only way he's going to be held accountable because he's going to get away with it here. So. It's just more, you know, he, they, I, I don't know, it seemed like a, a pathetic excuse to me as they're too busy looking at stuff for in the Washington case. And I think you're right. They're just spread very thin. They don't have a big law firm. And so they need more time. They needed another 30 days. And it was it was granted right away. It was just an easy kind of summary granting. I think this is a terrible uh, thing for Donald Trump that's not getting enough reporting. Uh, let me just put it this way. You're right that the November election is not going to directly, of course, none of this stuff's going to happen before the November election. But look what Judge Chutkin and down in the D.C. election interference case is allowing the government to do by adopting their their approach. Normally, as you know, as a prosecutor, when you got an indictment that may have some infirmities, the defendant goes first to move to dismiss the indictment and gets the last, gets the first word in the first brief and the last word in the reply brief with the government in the middle. That's not what she did. What she said was, I think it's a good idea what the government's proposal is. Um, you go first. You file a brief to tell me why the immunity decision uh, and how it maps onto your superseding indictment and why it survives. And then we'll hear from Mr. Trump. And then you go again. Now, they've already said at the Department of Justice that they're going to be airing new evidence. It's almost like what Donya Perry had said on your legal, on your mistrial, on your mistrial uh, episode, in which she said there could be a mini trial here. Well, at least there's going to be an airing of new evidence that we, you, me, Legal AF, and our audience have never seen before. Uh, and it's all going to be against Donald Trump to uh, to another moment to teach the American people who they're voting for in November. But they don't get to just do that once. They get two briefs, two bites at the apple before the election to air new evidence. And Donald Trump just has something in the middle in one brief. Terrible. So instead of like saying, because most people that are under the shadow of a criminal indictment, this is why we have the Speedy Trial Act. They want fast trial or a reasonably fast trial so they can clear their name, especially if their defenses are already in order and discovery is already done. You don't want the overhang of, um, especially when you're running for office like the presidency, you don't want the overhang. Let's get to trial. Although every time Donald Trump gets the trial, he loses $500 million uh, fraud case, $100 million ultimately to E. Jean Carroll, 34 felony convictions in Judge Marchand's courtroom. You know, it's not good for him to go fast. I get that. But he also doesn't get to present his evidence. And instead, Donald Trump, just to show you his adult judgment, uh, I would say as of late, but it's been going on for a long time. The first thing he did after a gunman had a gun hanging out of a bush in a golf course in Florida, uh, first thing he did the next day, before even we could have a, oh, goodwill, you know, let's rally around a guy who almost got nailed again is he started selling cryptocurrency with his sons, led by apparently Barron, uh, who's now the head of the, new, who's now the visionary in charge of his new cryptocurrency scheme. So even before we could figure out on this network, you know, we need to cover the, that assassination attempt, don't we? By the next day, when we were ready to do it, he was already off. It bored Donald Trump. He'd already moved on to selling crypto while he's running for president. So, uh, you know, the timing of things, is always to the advantage, of the, as far as I'm concerned, of the Department of Justice and the prosecutors. He's going to lose the Second Circuit argument to delay any further his uh, sentencing on the 26th of November in New York. And we'll talk about that as we get closer and the things that may be filed there. D.C. election interference case. We're going to get those two briefs to the American people before November 5. 
And then uh, sometime next month or so, we're going to get a final briefing into the 11th Circuit, and they're going to have to decide, and they will, that Judge Cannon was wrong and that she had made yet another reversible error, a major reversible error. And they're going to have to decide to, I think, to both um, reinstate the indictment, find that Jack Smith is a legitimate exercise of constitutional and presidential power, the appointment there, and uh, maybe get rid of her as well. I know there's some amicus briefs that are asking for all of that. Um, we're going to talk about, Karen, you have anything else to add about the timeline and the presentation of all this evidence to the American people before uh, the November election? You know, one of my absolute favorite things about you, Popak, and there are many, but one of my favorites is, you know, the sun never sets in Popak land, right? It's just, it's true. It's your optimism is just beautiful because it's just amazing to me that you are like, this is great. The timing's great. It's all going to be great. And I'm like, yes, only if he loses the election. You know, I, I just see all this as, well, if he wins the election, you know, the timing isn't so great. But That's I love the positive for. People what? come for the combination of Popakian, Popakian and the Grim Reaper that, that, you, that you often bring. Well, if he's elected again, I've moved on from that. I am not. I, am I not love buying. it. I love it. I'm it makes not. me so happy. I mean, Good. I know it actually makes our, I, I, honestly, I know because I read the comments. Yeah. I know that <laughs> it makes our audience happy. They I'm not come pandering. In, That's how I no, feel. No, it's true. But it's true. It's because <laughs> it's because people like me and a lot of people in our audience, they watch the news, they read the papers, and it's it's causes a lot of anxiety and stress oh, yeah. because there is a parade of horribles if he wins the election and it's a huge parade of horribles i mean you can put it you know fill in the blank of any topic what not just these cases but abortion women you know everything like you you mentioned you, you you name it and there is a parade of horribles and doom and gloom and i love though that you see the world in just this well like but let's also think about this positively because it gives people hope. And you know what? That's one of the reasons why I think the Obamas were, in addition to being amazing family and amazing president, you know, one of the reasons people loved them so much, including me, was because they give people hope. And hope is, you know, it's the number one thing that keeps people going. So I actually think it's fantastic. I love it. Welcome back. That was Legal AF, the podcast on the Midas Touch Network. Speaking of the Midas Touch Network, in collaboration with the Midas Touch Network, we just launched a new Legal AF YouTube channel. Yes, we did. At Legal AF MTN. What else would it be called? I'm curating the top stories at the intersection of law and politics and bringing it to you in a way that you've come to, uh, to become to love. Commentary and analysis of stories at the intersection of law and politics brought to you by people who know what they're talking about at that intersection. So until my next hot take, until my next Legal AF, and seeing you on the new Legal AF YouTube channel at Legal AF MTN. This is Michael Popak reporting. In collaboration with the Midas Touch Network, we just launched the Legal AF YouTube channel. Help us build this pro-democracy channel where I'll be curating the top stories, the intersection of law and politics. Go to YouTube now and free subscribe at Legal AF MTN. That's at Legal AF MTN.